Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to all our lovely viewers who are uh, with us on Lantern of Light on today's program, who have tuned in and inshallah who will uh, gradually tune in to watch today's second podcast of our uh, Lantern of Light's Ramadan Wellbeing podcast. Uh, as you know that uh, last time uh, in our introduction, I had... Uh, you know, uh, shared this amazing news with you all about the launch of our Shah Ramadan initiatives with you all. And, uh, you know, as we are really enjoying the beauty of this month to attain that spirituality and, uh, you know, to manifest uh, in everything uh, beyond our five senses and delve and dive into the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we hope and look forward uh, to having you as well enjoy this beautiful banquet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just want to take you uh, in a very quick recap as to what we did in our last podcast. So we are really working and focusing on mental health. Uh, mental health is an integral part of overall health and well-being uh, in Islam. And, uh, you know, seeking professional help and treatment for mental health uh, difficulties should be seen as an act of faith and worship and not a sign of weakness. Uh, if you remember, uh, we also uh, would love to encourage you to donate towards these programs that Lantern of Light uh, has introduced during this Shah Ramadan, because together we can really uh, heal minds and hearts with one donation at a time. And it will take you only 60 seconds to get on your phone and press the link to donate. The, the donation uh, link is available in our comment section, in our description, and it is also available on our Instagram page, on our stories, and in our bios, inshallah. This will really help us in many ways. Please do consider donating to our several other various Shah Ramadan campaigns, such as the Sahiba to Sajadiya podcast series, the Lantern of Lights mental health well-being podcasts, the Ramadan iftar parcels for the most underprivileged indigenous Shia families in Kenya, transforming journeys through Quran and Dua, the Layal al-Qadr events, and the orphans and widows educational projects, inshallah. Now, today's program is going to be uh, very exciting because we have a new discussion that we will be sparking on. Last time, we spoke about emotional maturity uh, with our esteemed uh, speaker, one of our esteemed panelists, Sister Sabira Kanji. And, you know, we really went into understanding what is the meaning of emotional maturity, what are some of the factors that contributed to some people being more emotionally mature than others, and, uh, you know, what were some of the ways in which we could develop emotional maturity. Now, on today's program, we will be talking about... Uh, uh, you know, conflict resolutions, right, in uh, relationships. So these relationships could be uh, marriages, uh, they could be healthy relationships, that they could be unhealthy relationships. So I think this is uh, a favorite topic to many. And uh, I am myself looking forward to having this intimate discussion with Sister Sabira. And uh, I would like to welcome Sister Sabira Kanji with us on board. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sister Sabira? Waalaikum salam. Waalaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Sister Sakina, thank you very much for providing this opportunity to talk on a very important topic. Because uh, when it comes to conflict resolution, you know, we usually feel that, you know, conflicts are not supposed to be there in relationships, whether it's our, with our spouse, with our kids, with our, at our work. But it is a very important and, in fact, a healthy thing to be when we talk about conflicts here. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure and honor. Before uh, jumping into our conversation, let me quickly introduce Sister Sabira. Sister Sabira Kanji is a clinical psychologist and a family therapist, and uh, she has her uh, master's done in family and systemic therapy. She is, of course, uh, living in Iran for the past uh, 
15 to 20 years and she conducts online therapy sessions uh, and she is also a, a therapist panel on various platforms such as Ask Those Who Know, Imam Connect and Faith Counseling. She's got her amazing Instagram page uh, with the uh, uh, handle Heal and Rise with Sabira where she, you know, uh, you know, tells us how to uh, work around with our emotions, how to regulate our emotions, how to manage uh, different sorts of uh, very latest, you know, situations. So with today's topic, as uh, Sister Sabra has already given a very nice brief introduction. So like, you know, when we hear about uh, the term conflict, right, the picture of a husband and wife, uh, having a heated argument uh, pop up in our minds, you know, and something like that. So, um, Sister Sabra, could you explain more about conflicts and, you know, whether they are healthy conflicts as well or not? Uh, so please uh, let us know, inshallah. Yeah. So the way you explained it, like, you know, when we hear the word conflict, we think, okay, there is this couple fighting or probably, you know, ready to throw something at each other and having this heated argument when the neighbors can also hear. But conflicts does not have to be like that. Yeah, it is actually a healthy thing because if imagine if we didn't have disagreements, like, you know, the, the famous quotation that it is uh, you know, agree to disagree. What does that mean? That you're open to have disagreements. You're open to have these conflicts so that you can actually resolve them. But yes, if it's something like, you know, a repetitive cycle and you're not being able to resolve it properly in a healthy way and it turns to something like, you know, like we described, that is not healthy. But generally, conflicts are healthy in a relationship because it means that you you find it safe or you find it okay to discuss your point of view and as human beings we will all have different points of view we will have our own perspectives on different things and if we see couples who are not actually having any sort of conflicts actually there is a question mark most probably one of them is not being able to to say anything to this uh, you know discuss how they feel or even if she has or he has a point of view which is different, but he or she does not find it safe to utter or to express themselves because of her or his own beliefs or because she finds herself or he finds himself, uh, you know, in a position which is oppressed. So he or she chooses not to say and the other person is probably an authoritative personality who is doing and saying and getting things done his or her own way. So usually when there are no conflicts or there are no discussions, there is an imbalance of power and one of them is being submissive, but it doesn't mean that this person is a robot. One day, you know, things will come up. The, all these repressed emotions and all this submissiveness will take its toll on the person. And this usually, you know, when couples come to me or even... Uh, individual clients when they come to me they they describe that you know when i got married you know this was what i the message that i'd gotten from my mother from my culture from my you know from uh, elders in the family that okay you know go there try to mold yourself and it's usually women i speak to so you know i'm just going to focus on the women that you know because women go from you know uh, uh, one home to another and they are the ones who require more adjustments and they're expected to just mold somehow, you know, just to uh, be the way your in-laws and your husband is expecting you to be without uh, without expressing what you want or whether it's comfortable for you or not comfortable for you. So they do that for some period of time and then it gets too much to, for them. And that is when you actually they develop symptoms of, you know, sometimes anxiety, depression, they feel who am I? You know, those, all those questions. What is my uh, what is my role in this house? Who am I? What am I? What about my needs? What about my dreams? Am I now supposed to just forget everything and be this wife and a mother or a daughter-in-law that I'm expected to be? Or shall I, you know, have some parts of my, my own, you know, personality? So that is when, you know, uh, yes, in the beginning years, it might be okay for her or she might feel she can do it. Yes, she can do it. And obviously it's glamorous. It's like, wow, you know, you've done so well just because you're not saying anything and you're just uh, molding yourself and not being, 
not saying any word or, you know, and that's appreciated, but no one really understands or realizes that she's actually going through a lot of emotions and, uh, you know, these thoughts and these uh, ideas about, okay, what what is this like? You know, it's too much for her to take, but because she's taking in, people feel, okay, you know, it's, it's normal. And we also did it, like, you know, Yes, Sister Sabra. I think we've. Uh... Sister Sakina, Sister Sabra. lost your voice. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, can you hear me now, yeah, Sister you're... Sabra? Yeah, yes, yeah. you may continue. Yes, I can. Yeah, so that was the basic, um, you know, idea that, you know, conflicts are not actually unhealthy. They are actually healthy and they, you know, having conflicts does not mean that you are this, you know, horrible couple or terrible couple who, who is a failure or whatever, right? It is actually good to have conflicts. It's the way you solve it and the way you, uh, you know, find that middle ground. That is what, inshallah, we're going to further talk about. And so, you know, the idea that couples who don't have arguments are the best couples or they don't, you know, have any disagreement, well, that's not a good idea. It is okay to have that's a good idea. That okay. is normal. That is healthy. Okay, fine. Uh, you know what? I really love the points that you mentioned, uh, especially there was a point where you mentioned that, you know, there are sometimes, this is sometimes what happens in certain relationships where maybe a person uh, is, uh, a spouse is maybe very submissive and, you know, they take it in, they take it in. And then finally one day, uh, you know, those expressions and emotions blow up, you know, this the way the volcano uh, erupts, you know, is explosive, right? So, um I just want to share a very quick uh, real life story over here. Uh, I was uh, uh, watching this clip and uh, uh, Sayyid Jawad Al-Qazwini, actually, he was the one uh, who was mentioning this, uh, that there was a couple in Florida uh, who had come to him for some consultation. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what happened was that initially the man was really impressed with the woman, you know, and he came to the sheikh and he told him that, you know, I really uh, want to get married uh, to this girl because uh, she's, mashallah, very efficient. Like uh, she, you know, washes uh, the dishes and, you know, she the way she serves on the table, uh, she, you know, uh, irons the clothes and like she's a proper, you know, traditional uh, girl and mashallah, she's very obedient and everything. So I want her. And, uh, you know, when I even tell her some jokes, she laughs at my jokes. So, you know, Sheikh, I think I'm really interested in her and, you know, I want to get married to her and everything. So the Sheikh, uh, you know, obviously they get married and everything. Now it's been like uh, just six months or seven and the Sheikh receives a call from the girl. And the girl says that, Sheikh, I need to meet you up. Uh, can I please uh, have a meeting with you? And so the sheikh gets surprised, you know, because he was expecting maybe an invite or something. Uh, so he's like, uh, okay, where should we meet up? And she says, I want to meet you in your office. Can I come to you and meet you? So he's like, okay. So when she comes, uh, she's like all this, you know, worried and tensed and complaining. She's like, you know what, sheikh, I'm so tired already. Uh, it's been six months into my marriage, but I'm not happy. Turns out my husband is a double. And so the sheikh gets so surprised. He's like, what do you mean? Why are you saying your husband is a double? And she says that sheikh, you know, he expects me to do all the housework. He comes back from work. He expects the table to be ready with food. He expects the clothes to be ironed. He expects the dishes to be done. He expects like everything to be ready. And he doesn't help me out in any way, you know, like he is not contributing in anything. And so I am feeling this as a pressure, you know, I'm feeling like what is my role and what is my duty in this? And then the sheikh, you know, just listens. And then uh, he also the, the, the husband, you know, he comes in and the sheikh talks to him and asks him like, you know, is this true what your wife is saying? And then he says that, yeah, it's true, uh, you know, since the time I've been trying to talk to her, when I crack my jokes, she doesn't laugh anymore. She makes faces right now. If I ask her to bring for me some food now, you know, she's got this uh, anger issues and everything. So uh, this is like uh, just a simple example of what really goes on into some marriages, as you explained very clearly. 
uh, I, you know, there was this imbalance that we're seeing in the couple, right? Like the husband already had set up these high expectations, a very high standard of expectation from the girl. And the girl had her own expectations that, okay, you know, when I'll get into this marriage, I, my husband will also help me, you know, like we will be equal, we will do things together, mm -hmm. but then it didn't turn out to be like that for her. And so there was this uh, conflict and everything that was happening. So uh, the sheikh was, you know, just giving like an example, like this is what usually happens. Um, but then of course, I think it must have been sorted out. The sheikh must have sorted it out and everything. So um, moving on to our discussion, Sister Sabra, uh, when we speak about, you know, these couples, right? As you said, what are some of the unhealthy ways that couples usually use to resolve their conflicts? Yeah. So, you know, uh, continuing from what you said, right, one of the important things that we, uh, you know, as um, people who are not yet married or, you know, who are looking forward to getting married, or even if who have been married, it's about having these open discussions about your expectations, right? Because you see, we all grew up in different households, whether even if you're cousins or even if you are, you know, uh, you feel that, okay, I know this guy in and out or the girl in and out because, you know, we have grown up in the same neighborhood or whatever, right? You are going to be different. Your expectations from, you know, your spouse is going to be different. And we usually pick on, you know, what our parents, how our parents were and other, you know, other uh, teachings that come in and all that. And we have this idea that okay this is how my spouse is going to be just like you know this uh, husband who already had this preconceived idea that this is how my wife is going to be and his I think main focus was you know acts of services that she should be ser serving me and that is going to be you know wow like you know I'm going to be happy and but you know, you know, there was no understanding of what are her needs, right? So having those conversations are really crucial because, you know, you might have this idea, but your idea might completely might, you know, uh, be wrong. Like, you know, this person is not what you uh, want uh, her to be or him to be like, right? So when it comes to unhealthy ways, you know, when, like you said, you know, what happened in this case or the, you know, the... Uh, question we discussed earlier is that we repress our emotions we take it all in take it all in one day you know it just comes out and when it comes out it is usually anger and there is usually there is a lot of exchange of words that we regret later why does that happen is because we are just piling up our emotions we are just you know trying to Okay, uh, Sister Sabra, are you there with us? I can move. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I think I just lost you for a second, but I think you're back now. Yeah, so I'm saying a lot of couples avoid any kind of conflict. So that is the first thing, yeah? Instead of avoiding or brushing it under the carpet, you know, acknowledge, yes, that there is a problem, right? If you don't yeah. acknowledge that there is a problem you'll not do anything to solve it right and you'll just yeah. be repressing whatever emotions you have or whatever you know you're feeling when xyz you know like your spouse does something if it's irritating you it's, it's bothering you and you just try to ignore it try to ignore it. it's not going to go away right every time yeah. the spouse does that again you will get triggered but you're just not uh, confronting and having that conversation. So the first thing is, you know, uh, when it comes to unhealthy patterns of resolving is avoiding the whole thing, avoiding that there is a problem, right? The second thing is silent treatment. Many of us, when we are upset or when we are angry, instead of having that conversation, what we do is we just, you know, shut down. You know, so That's let's true. say if, uh, if a wife is upset because her husband her husband always comes late, let's say, right? So when he comes, she'll just say salam, you know, very blank salam, and then she'll just continue in the kitchen as if she's got a lot of work and she won't talk to him and, you know, give her that, give him that, yeah. you know, silent treatment. Or after, yeah. you know, having, yeah? So after having a, um, let's say, a heated argument, they just stop talking to each other for three days. And then after those three days are over, or so two days are over, they act normal. They don't come and sit and talk about what was bothering them or what happened or how could have, uh, you know, how could we have dealt it 
you know, in a healthier way, they just stop talking. Why? Because they are frustrated, they're angry, they feel no one listens to them, no one, you know, pays attention to them, or, you know, this idea is what's the point of talking? He's going to continue his way, I'm going to continue my so better not to talk but you are living together you are partners you will need to talk and having those uncomfortable conversations yes it might be uncomfortable yes you might feel vulnerable but that is okay you have to feel vulnerable in front of your partner that is one relationship where you know you have to feel safe and when i say have to doesn't mean that it's one person's responsibility it's both right as a spouse, you need to provide that safe space for your spouse to be vulnerable or to, you know, to be heard, to be understood, right? And one of right. one of the other unhealthy ways is like we start blaming each other. Like, you know, like if there is a problem, let's say, uh, if the problem is, let's say, finance or it's like maybe the in-laws, whatever it is, right? What happens if we start, it's you, it's your fault. Let, let's say if it's a husband and wife and the wife feels, uh, you know, feels that the husband doesn't support her when it comes to her, her in-laws, right? And this is something very common in our culture. Uh, so he cannot, he does not want to take sides, but she feels, uh, you know, that he should, let's say that's the problem, right? So what happens is they start blaming each other. You should have spoken up for me when your mother was telling me X, Y, Z. He says, I can't, you know, so it's all about blaming. You should understand you, you, you. So it's all about what you should be doing and blaming each other that, you know, why is this happening again and again? So a lot of blaming. And when we are angry, that's what we usually do. We start blaming each other. Uh, what what the focus what, what happens with the focus is the focus is now on finding who is at fault rather than what shall we do about the problem so again the problem does not get solved it's just about okay who who is the culprit okay who is the person to be blamed right and and a lot of you know to and fro conversations of you 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 did this you didn't do this you are always like this you know those kind of conversations do not end up in resolving any sort of um, conflict. Another unhealthy way in which people resolve conflicts, or when they are angry, or when they are triggered, is they bring the past, right? So you see, if this is the same problem, like you know, with the in-laws, so she, he, the wife will remind him again and again of what he has done in the past. You did not stand up for me when you know your mother was doing like this. You didn't, you know, when the night we got married. Uh, your sister said this to me and you know I felt so because she's still uh, the emotions yeah. are still unhealed you know unhealed. it comes up again and again so even if it's not in-laws you know uh, I don't want to paint a picture that it's you know it's a terrible thing to be with in-laws but yeah. that's the example that comes up a lot in in my sessions as well you know like this is a real struggle so you know bringing the past is again not an a healthy way. Why? Because again, what you're doing is you're trying to uh, bring proofs or bring um, examples that you want to prove yourself that I'm not a good fault, right? But again, you're not doing anything to solve the problem. You're just trying to, you know, like, like a court case that I have evidence one, two, three, four, right? But that's not yes. going to help you solve the problem. Some people also bring other people like, you know, your like let's say if it's a problem between the husband and wife and they bring oh your mother is like that your father is like that you know again you know they're bringing all these things in fact not realizing that it's not going to solve the problem it's just you know increasing it sometimes right so these are a few sure. um, ways in which which are unhealthy and obviously there are other things like you know insulting each other cursing each other i don't know uh, using the d word these are things that are you know obviously going to impact the relationship they're hurtful words that will have an impact on the person and the relationship because we have to have some ground rules like you know and one of them is respect no matter how angry you are no matter how hurt you are crossing that red line you know that uh, you, where you forget to be respectful is obviously going to have uh, an impact on the relationship absolutely oh my god uh, sister sabra i think you have touched on some very crucial points and uh, really you know i wish uh, people could 
you know, acknowledge these points, could actually uh, understand the uh, significant of each of these points that you've mentioned, um, silent treatment, uh, you know, insulting each other, uh, unknowingly gaslighting each other, blaming each other, uh, holding these uh, grudges from the past, you know, it's very true, like sometimes, you know, you just hold on to that thing, um, 20 years go down the lane, you know, your kids have now grown up, and you've still got that grudge uh, stuck in your heart, and you know, you can't move on, and it keeps coming back and forth, and it really, you know, ruins the relationship, it destroys the relationship, and uh, it becomes difficult. And then even, you know, it, it passes down to the kids as well. You know, we don't realize this, but it passes down to generations to generations. So we need to stop that. We need to break that cycle. We need to know where to put an end to certain things in, a, in an unhealthy relationship, as you mentioned. Now, Sister Sabra, that you will mentioned what were some of the ways of, uh, what were the unhealthy, uh, uh, you know, ways that couples usually uh, have in their uh, conflicts. Now let's talk about the healthy ways. What are some of the healthy ways in which couples can resolve their conflicts? Yeah. So the first, first and foremost, it's important to recognize that, you know, there are some things that trigger you or that some things that, you know, you feel hurt by or you feel uh, you cannot deal with it emotionally, right? And talking about those things uh, when, you know, when you are at calm, both of you, not when, you know, there are things already heated up and then you decide to talk, oh, I'm hurt, I'm this, I'm that, you don't care, you know, it's not going to come out in a in a healthy way, right? So when you see that your anger, your frustration, or your feeling overwhelmed, whatever the emotion is, if it's already at 10, if it's at peak, that is not the time when you should be resolving conflicts. That is actually the time a time when you should be taking a break. Let's say you know there's an argument and it's getting heated up. One of you, you know, has to say that, okay, you know what, we are not going to go with this anywhere. Let's take a break. Let's calm down, right? So recognizing what triggers you but not addressing it at the time when you are you know when your emotions are at peak that is the time when you need to take a break and then talk about it when you are at you know you are at a calmer position when you can have a logical conversation not just an emotional conversation the second thing is active listening you know we are good at listening to strangers but we are not good at listening to you know our spouses our children we are always already thinking of what i need to reply and this is very so, common, even with our kids, you know, they are telling us something we already have this long lecture prepared that I'm going to tell this to my yes. kid, and we don't uh, listen to that child, right? Or the, our spouse, right? Because we take them for granted or we know them or we think we know them very well. Well, you know, that's not right. the case. You need to listen. And when I say listen, it does not mean you just listen like quietly. You have to have the correct body language, you have to have that eye contact, you have to know, nod, you have to, let's say, reframe what they're saying. If, if let's say, your wife is saying, you know, I've had a, such a, a hard day today, you know, the kids drove me nuts, blah, blah, blah. So the husband, you know, has to say, okay, you know, like reframe it. Oh, I can see it was such a tough day for you. Just that one line will, in, you know, feel make her feel that, yes, he understands or make her, you know, if, or she'll find it safe to continue to have that conversation rather than being judged or, you know, oh, I also had a hard day. That's not good. That's you're going to shut down that conversation, right? Active listening right. is a skill and we can learn it. Even if we didn't learn it till now, like, you know, for whatever reasons, it's something that you can learn. Like, you know, how to respond to people when they're talking, right? That is yeah. uh, one of the healthier ways. Another healthy way is to use um, the I language. This is something that I work a lot on with my uh, clients because what happens is, like we said, you know, when when there is a conflict, we usually use the you language. You did this. You don't understand. You, why do you not, you know, do X, Y, Z, right? Whenever you use you language, the other person will get defensive. Like, let's say, yeah. uh, let's say if there's a wife, she's been working, you know, she's been uh, looking after the kids, cooking, cleaning, everything, and she's feeling overwhelmed, right? 
and she sees her and it's weekend and she sees her husband on her phone on his phone you know wasting time and she's getting irritated and you know and then it comes out like you know why can't you just get up and help me you know you okay. again you right so yeah. what is his response going to be is usually something like defensive he will say you know uh, well i'm doing something work related on my phone or you know i was working the whole week i'm just relaxed and can't you see that can't you even see that like you know it's going to come out as you know he won't understand how she's going what she's going through right so rather yeah. than that she can use the i language and say you know, i feel so overwhelmed today and you know i've been there's so much on my plate so when she says her point of view how she feels or what she thinks he will understand he will say okay what can i do to help you do you want me to look after the mm. child or whatever right so when you right. uh, express your point of view what, what is the his action how is that action impacting you how are you feeling about it or what does it you know make you think or whatever right so using the i language i would like you to or i feel xyz it's a game changer i mean like it really helps the other person to understand you and that person will not get defensive right so this is a very important technique a very crucial one another one is actually you know uh, there's this um, psychologist who who has I, I think you must have come across that there are four uh, four um, consequences of resolving a conflict. Sometimes it's a win-win, win-win situation, which is where we we all want to get. Like you know, it shouldn't be that one person always wins. When I say win, it doesn't mean that. I mean, it might sound like you know, okay, you know, one person's point of view is to be accepted and the other person's point of view is to be rejected. That's not a healthy one. So win lose is when the first person wins and the second person loses. Like you know, his point of view is not catered at all, or her point of view. The other one is lose win. The third one is lose lose. That you know, it's so heated up. You talk, you talk, but you know, it doesn't get anywhere. You know, there's no winner, no loser. But the last one is win win. So how do we get to that win-win situation is when we uh, accommodate each other, right? So we are looking for a middle ground, right? The word compromise is usually um, negatively used. It sounds like one of them has to, you know, give in kind of thing, but it's not that. It's like, you know, uh, compromise is uh, actually a very um, good part of a relationship, but obviously not just one person compromising and the other person not it's about understanding each other's you know point of view okay like uh, we said, they're repressing our needs hmm. is there a problem Pro with the connection oh, yeah okay, there sorry. was slightly but don't worry yeah okay yeah, so, so finding a middle ground, uh, empathizing with, uh, with each other, looking at what, how can we meet in the middle is one of, yes. uh, you know, one of the techniques, which is a healthy conflict, conflict resolution techniques. Uh, another one is validating each other. Again, it's related to the previous one. When, when, when someone is trying to tell you their part of the story, you validate, oh, it must be difficult for you. Oh, it must have been so hard or whatever, right? Oh, I can see your mm -hmm. own, well. you know, validating their emotions. That will yes. make that person feel, okay, this person actually understands me. And then you can come with solutions that work for uh, both of you, right? So right. yeah, these are some of the important ways. And, so, and if you think that, you know, you simply can't, can't do that or you know you you are failing to do that there is always professional help right and mm -hmm. professional help doesn't mean that you know we are going to judge you or we're going to you know see who is at fault and who is not we as therapists help you to find those uh, healthy ways in which you can relate to each other and have a healthy relationship because like you said it impacts the children it, it impacts the children very deeply we don't realize right so children who have been through like, let's say you know who have watched their parents have conflicts unhealthy ways of conflicts they carry it throughout right and it impacts their marriage at a later stage as well so it's it, you know you can get help and 
save your relationship and the future relationships inshallah 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 we pray for so <laughs> and uh, thank you for highlighting and sharing those those amazing points sister sabira uh, indeed we need to really look into the active listening uh, validating our emotions and several other points that you've mentioned um coming down to our uh, last question sister sabira uh, as you have worked with many couples right so what are some common issues that you have observed that uh, you know lead to conflicts amongst uh, couples yeah. so um like you said you know there are a range of issues but what i have seen is somewhere you know all these issues come down to freedom some somewhere right when i say freedom it means that you know when one person feels that this person is not free to let's say um choose like let's say free to use her time or his time or money or freedom to express freedom to go freedom you know so many things that comes down sometimes to freedom and also yes. uh, you know finding the balance between independence and interdependence so you are you know in a relationship but that doesn't mean that you don't have a personality or you wouldn't you know you won't continue to do things your way or your values will change uh, will not change right you are a person and you have your own personal boundaries you have your own values you have your interests you cannot change completely for this other person and this expectation yeah. that you will is a very, very false expectation so a lot of lot of things uh, come up in couples um, sessions like um, recently i was working with a couple their main issue was cleanliness like you know the way the house is supposed to be clean right and yeah. it might sound well that's no it's no big deal but it is a big deal why okay. it's not the cleanliness actually it's what is behind it right so the problem sometimes might seem well it's no big deal you know you can divide you can you know do superficial you know monitoring organizing blah 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 but it's behind it's like you know when the house was clean in a particular way this man found it that this is the way he would control things right so usually yeah. when it comes to couples the the problems they bring up are not usually the problems which are the actual problems it's about their beliefs it's about how let's say you know how their mothers and fathers did things like you know what happens usually uh, is that men usually uh, look at their wives like a uh, you know a continuation of their mothers right and i know mm -hmm. it's a very uh, it's a i might be judged for this statement but there are so many examples that i've come across when you know let's say the same thing like cleanliness or even time like you know if the man expects you know if he says four o'clock and she is for you know she's late and it's 4 10 and he gets irritated it's usually something to do with his beliefs about time the way time was you know um, seen in his own household right and similarly for the woman sometimes you know she idealizes this person to be like her father right so if her father right. was someone who uh, let's say got things fixed as soon as you know they got spoiled at home like let's say you know if the door doorknob is uh, broken or if the car is not washed her father would just do it right that was him so her right. expectation sometimes would stem out from that men should do these things right so it's about our shoulds right. our beliefs right sometimes the problem in hand is not the problem it's your belief about how men should be how a wife should be how a husband should be and that is what you know brings clashes like you know you are different beliefs like we come with our own baggages and then we are having this relationship with this new person right so until and unless we don't uh, you know heal from those baggages whatever they are right sometimes it's not healing it's about just our beliefs about being flexible with our beliefs and then forming new beliefs right so uh, these are just a few things that come to my mind about uh, you know about what topics usually couples can have an argument about absolutely perfect uh, i think uh, you have really uh, you know very beautifully explained uh, 
the things that I think we all really needed to hear. Uh, thank you so much, Sister Sabra. And you know, you tried to really show us uh, like this picture of what really goes on in different scenarios. So like, like I was even able to connect with a few of them, uh, especially the part where you mentioned that, you know, how a daughter sees her father in her husband, you know, her a fatherly uh, a figure, because, you know, when we see how our fathers used to do certain things in the house and, you know, we expect our uh, husbands to do the same, right? And similarly, as you said, how the husbands in turn, you know, expect their wives to be uh, just like their mothers, right? In, when it comes to even cooking, like sometimes, you know, when you cook a dish for them and they would still go like, uh, you know, uh, I, I miss my mother's food or like, you know, this doesn't taste exactly like my mother's, but yeah, it's good enough, you know? So, you know, we get those, we often tend to hear these kind of dialogues as well. So yeah, it really, uh, uh, you know, makes sense about the things that you've mentioned. But inshallah, we hope, uh, all of us, that we can try to make uh, certain improvements uh, in our uh, relationships to make it as healthy as possible. And the misconception that we have that, you know, a perfect marriage is a marriage without any conflict. So as you said, that is a false expectation. Rather, it means that there is an imbalance, of course. Uh, so do have these conflicts, but it, resolve them in a very healthy way. As Sister Sabara Kanji has mentioned about the healthy ways of resolving it and how to recognize the symptoms of uh, the unhealthy ways. And inshallah, we make things work out. I would like to thank Sister Sabra Kanji once again for taking out her precious time and for sharing this amazing conversation with us. Thank you so much, Sister Sabra. Uh, we would like to thank you from Lantern of Light. And uh, please, please, everybody make sure to, you know, tune in to these amazing conversations. Let us know uh, your comments in the feedback section and uh, let us know if there are any other ways that we can help you improve your lifestyle. And uh, with that, I would like to end our today's program. Please make sure to uh, donate to uh, uh, you know our various Shah Ramadan campaigns, uh, as mentioned uh, even earlier. The donation link is available in the description box, and uh, you know please do not forget to put the reference right to what you are donating for. And uh, if you are a UK taxpayer, then please consider to tick the gift aid box, inshallah. And with that, we would like to wish you all a very happy Ramadan. Jazakumullahu khairan. Thank you so much, Sister Sabira. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Sakina and Lenten of Light. And I will just emphasize that, you know, uh, donate for this cause of, which has been started by Lenten of Light, where we are actually providing therapy to people who cannot afford it. And this is such a great initiative and inshallah you can pay, uh, you can donate so that uh, we can provide the services to people who are in need of sessions, who are in need of therapy, but are just holding back because they cannot afford the sessions. And our sessions are, we are charging minimum. So, you know, whatever you pay is, uh, you know, going to reach families and people who really need that help, inshallah. Thank you very much once again. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khairan. This is your host, Sakina Habib, signing off. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.